So the Vampires of Bloody Island. With me, Alan Kempthorne, director. Hey. You're the writer as well? Uh, yeah, co-writer along with my wife, Pamela. Uh, right. We worked on the project very much together. Um, we It was the first feature film we've written together. We wrote a comedy for the BBC before that didn't go anywhere, as most comedies you try and write for the BBC don't. Mm. Uh, so, yeah, we rewrote the feature film together. We made it together. And... Uh, <laughs> Here it is. Here Fantastic. it exists. The Vampires of Bloody Island. Blimey. So, now look, it, it's, it's a campus Christmas romp. Um, it's, it's a very entertaining piece of, of British cinema. Why, thank you, sir. And uh, why, why would you choose to do that? Why don't you make you know, what most people make in Britain, which is t rather serious? Because most people make rather serious films. Right. <laughs> no, we, we didn't want to do that. I mean, um, you know, th there are... It's, it's kind of... The easiest thing to do, I guess, is to go out and film with real people in streets, uh, in the office, in your house, in the pub, and to do all of that sort of stuff. Uh, but the whole point of us doing a film was we wanted to do fantasy. Mm -hmm. We wanted to get in and create a whole world of, of excitement and, and invent something that just didn't exist. Right. Because they're the sort of films that, you know, get me. Right. And it, but it is a really a niche film, isn't it? I mean, it's, it's a vampire movie and then it's a vampire comedy, mm -hmm. parody. You know, it's a, did, did you consciously go for a niche because you knew that that would be a market that would be underserved and therefore, you know, you could get in there and do really well? Yeah, very definitely. We were trying to think about what sort of film we could do with, um, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm not a known name. My wife, Pamela, she's not a known name. So we had to figure out what sort of film we could do that would sell without big names. And to do that, you've got to go genre, you've got to go niche. And vampire films are, the uh, best thing I like about vampire films, they don't date. Right. If you look at a rom-com, for instance, you know, within two, two years, it's dated. Uh, you look at a thriller, within five years, it's dated. But people are still watching Nosferatu from 1926. People are still watching the Hammer films from the 1960s and 70s. People are still watching Blade from the 80s. So, you know, they're going to be watching The Vampires of Bloody Island for years and years and years to come. <laughs> That's the plan, and I believe it's a good plan. Sell, sell, <laughs> sell, baby. Hey, it's what we've got to do. So, um, you're also a professional extra. I mean, you're a trained classical actor, mm -hmm. but you're a professional extra as well. So you've been hanging out on big sets and, and you know, the Batman movies, Harry Potter. Um, what have you learnt from that experience? Yeah, I mean, hanging around on the film sets, that's, that's my life. I've been doing that for 15 years. As you say, I trained as an actor, uh, and I soon realised that most actors I know, um, there's a statistic, I think something like 9 out of 10 actors aren't in work at any given time. Instead of being on a film set, they're waiting tables or flipping burgers or, or delivering your post. That's, that's where actors are. Um, I decided that rather than doing that, I would just go and be on a film set, uh, working as a supporting artist, working as a stand-in as well, vet sometimes various crew members, but being on the film sets and experiencing what's, right. what goes on all the time. And yeah, it's been a phenomenal way to and learn. What, what have you picked up that you can offer to independent filmmakers that you've been able to use as well? Oh, bloody loads. <laughs> right. uh, I mean, for a start, the first thing that you notice uh, when you're on a film set, and this is something that you don't really seem to get taught at film school. Um, for instance, on, on our film, we had a lot of crew who were from film school, and and they were not aware of what goes on on the, uh, on the big film sets. And that's basically the very, very hard commitment to excellence. I mean, everyone knows you've got to work hard on a film, right? Yeah. Um, but what people don't understand, until you actually go on something, uh, a big professional budget, like as you say, I've done the Batman films, Dark Knight and Batman Begins. I've been in lots of the Harry Potter films. I've done Johnny English, V for Vendetta. I've, you know, basically been working in those sort of films for 15 years. Everyone in every department, whether it's your makeup, whether it's your camera, whether it's your set design, they do not stop until they've given 100% excellence. One thing you never hear on, on one of those big film sets is, yeah, that's good enough. Hmm. You just do not hear that phrase because good enough isn't good enough. Right. You, you've got to go for the great. You've got to go for the magic. Um, to, to sort of put this in, in some sort of detail, for instance, on, on Dark Knight, the Batman film, uh, I played a Gotham City uh, detective, which was pretty cool. I had my own detective's office. I was in the room when Batman beat up the Joker. That's a pretty cool thing to do. Um, but in my office, there were uh, yellow pages on my desk. 
and they were Gotham City right. yellow pages. All the paperwork on my desk were from the Gotham City Fire Department or Gotham City Bakeries. And it's that level of detail that you get in the set design, in the props design. The costumes are just so very well color coordinated. You know, if, if, they, if the director's decided he's going for, say, a blue palette for the film, then all your costumes will have that bluish tinge just to get that feeling across. And that's not something that I see people coming from film school right. with an understanding of. Right. Any other tips or, or tricks you can offer that you've seen on, on big film sets? Yeah, there's, there's a, lot of, a lot of ways that the big films tend to cheat things so that they can achieve the impossible. Um, that, when, that people from film school, when, when they've heard me talking about it, they go, oh, no, but that won't work. Um, for instance, so many times I've been in a crowd uh, and I'm, the camera's facing this way and I'm in the crowd, here's your actor there, and then the camera cuts to that way and there's the crowd there and I'm in that crowd as well. Uh, so I'm actually in two places at once. Now we know this doesn't make sense. Mm. Uh, I'm just wearing a different hat or something. Now on the surface of it you'd think, hang on, hang on, isn't the audience going to notice that? But the truth is the mm. audience never does because right. unless the film's phenomenally bad, why would they be investigating the faces of people blurred right. in the background? Of course, they should be watching the actors. Precisely. They're only ever looking in the actor's eyes, aren't yeah. they? They're connecting on that kind of very, very deep level. That's, that's how we consume stories in, in film. Precisely. If, you, if you're watching all the background stuff going on, if you're paying attention to that, the film's not doing its job, the story's not there. Right, right. 